Flight attendants, please prepare for takeoff. Stolen by Ehlers to Wheeler, back to Ehlers, scores! Kyle Connor has the Midas touch right now! And another outstanding stop by Connor Hellebuck! Check the shoot, score! Oh, what a slick move by Mark Sipley! Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. Hello and welcome to another episode of Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Joined here over Zoom with Mitchell Clinton of Jets TV and Jamie Thomas from 680 CJOB. Guys, the Winnipeg Jets are on a four-game uh, win streak right now. Things are going really well. Uh, this week, only two games on the calendar uh, against the Montreal Canadiens on Thursday and Saturday late into the night. Uh, Jets obviously get the win in both. Saturday, they get the 2-1 OT win and obviously a 6-3 win on Thursday. Mitchell, what did you see from those two games against Montreal? I just want to say after the 9 p.m. start, uh, we are recording this at 12.35 p.m. Central. I have had two very sizable coffees, and I'm eyeing up a third one in the future here. So Ooh. that's where we're at on this one. Uh, two very different wins. Um, obviously, like the first one you look back at, it's a comeback win, something the Jets have done. Uh, this year, but they were dominant in the, in the second half of the game. You know, they rattle off five unanswered goals to turn that 3-1 deficit into a 6-3 win. Kyle Connor, he's one of five Jets to get multiple points on that night. And then Saturday was just much different. Uh, second game for the Habs under uh, Dominic Ducharme. So obviously they were going to be a little bit different with having a practice under their belt. Montreal played with a lot of pace that night and really seemed to be an absolute handful, especially in the third period, out shooting the Jets 14-2 which you don't often see from the Jets, but Connor Hellebuck was Connor Hellebuck. I think he kind of, if if the league needed reminding, he gave them a nice little reminder of why he's the reigning Vezina Trophy winner, making 40 saves. Um, and if they gave out, you know, tertiary assists, he would have picked one up on the overtime winner as well. Uh, I thought that was a key move by him to prevent the icing that would have, you know, produced another face-off and a chance to lose possession by Hellebuck breaking that up and, moving it to Nikolai Ehlers and up the ice came the Jets. Uh, they were able to maintain possession. So there's that uh, as well. The other thing for Connor Hellebuck that uh, it was a stat that stood out to me since he came into the league in, in 2015, 16, that's his 14th regular season win, making at least 40 saves. There's only one other goaltender in that span that's got more and he's got 50 and that's Frederick Anderson of the Maple Leafs. So just kind of shows the kind of goaltending that uh, Connor Hellebuck has provided the Jets. So two very different wins for sure. But uh Considering the Canadians came into this one point back of the Jets in the standings with the same amount of games played, you wanted to try to create a little bit of separation, and the Jets were able to do that. Jamie, the Jets give up two early in the first period against the Habs on Thursday. You know, earlier in the season, and Paul has talked about this many times, that first period after a road trip, and the Jets seem to handle the adversity that's been put in front of them on a number of occasions this season. Just what have you seen in that section of their game? Well, Tyler, I, I think we've seen a lot of it throughout the year. Uh, they fall behind 2 nothing in Vancouver uh, the game before Thursday. They fall behind 2 nothing in the first period against Montreal. And, and that game against the Canadians, it was two mistakes. They gave the puck deep in Montreal's game that transition game is incredible and Paul had talked about it extensively about you can't do that against the Canadians so lo and behold they make two mistakes and it's in the back of their net so they change their game and don't get away from trying to get that next goal and forcing things uh I've seen it so many times this year where you think you know they're in a little bit of trouble but there's no panic on the bench and you've heard Paul use the term the bench was right over and over again, it's it's just been right all the time. There's there's no panic with the Winnipeg Jets. They're three lines deep now. They know they can get offense at some point at any time. And then you look back behind you and you have Connor Hellebuck, you know is not going to let that next goal in. It reminds me a lot of the 1980s when Grant Fuhr wouldn't let in that next goal for the Edmonton Oilers. Like His goals against average was you know high threes, but it was all about not letting that next goal. And I've seen Connor Hellebuck do it. I've seen Lauren Bressois do it. Just the goaltending has been stellar. So when you know... That next save is going to be made. You don't have to push things. There's no panic in the roster. It's just everything is working so well for them right now. And that's about a veteran leadership, veteran hockey club. You, Paul's been talking about how young they were for years now. All of a sudden you have this older team that doesn't make mistakes, 
doesn't get away from their game plan and there's no panic ever. And it's been shown over and over again. It's just, it's been really neat to watch. One of the things that's been really neat to watch as well, uh, Mitchell, is the three forwards in overtime. Uh, Jets are 2-0 and when they uh, go with that formation in their last two games that go to overtime. Just why does that work? I guess, what, what, what makes that tick? You know, after they had success with it in Vancouver, I was curious, as soon as the, the final buzzer went against Montreal, I, I was wondering, you know, are they going to go with the three forwards again? Because, I mean, you know, Shifley and, and uh, Dubois and Wheeler scored the overtime winner in 27 seconds. It's not like you got much of a look at it. Uh, to, and it's hard to know if, you know, if, if another group coming over the bench uh, is three forwards again, because that's the thing that the Jets have. They got eight, nine, like, you know, high end, high skill forwards that they can throw over the uh, over the boards if they want. Uh, to be able to run three forwards for a while. So I was, I had my eye on the Jets bench against the, the Canadians to see if they do it again. And they did. I mean, Kyle Connor and, and Nikolai Ehlers come over the boards. They're a handful with open ice. And then Paul Stastny comes out. He was, I think Paul Maurice said he was running at about 60% or so in, a, in the faceoff dot uh, after regulation time. And as we know, overtime is so much about possession. Um, and Paul Stastny comes out and wins that draw. So that's the first thing. If you're able to win that face off um, and get yourself possession, especially with those forwards on the ice, then that obviously creates a number of opportunities for you. The other thing too, is as much as I talk about the, the speed and skill that these guys have, you look at the overtime winner against the Vancouver Canucks, it's Blake Wheeler winning a 50, 50 puck. Uh, I believe it was against uh, Elias Pettersson in the Jets zone. Uh, so you also have guys that can win those puck battles and force a change of possession when it's necessary and when it's absolutely needed. And that's exactly what, you know, some of these guys are doing. They always hear about Kyle Connor's great stick, how he can knock things down. Mark Shifley is an absolute handful below the dots in either zone. Um, so then, you know, that's, there's a few aspects of why it seems to work for the Winnipeg Jets. But the number one thing is when they tend to get possession, it's it's real hard to take it off of them. And usually the only way that that happens is if they've shot the puck and had a real good scoring chance. And against the Montreal Canadiens, they had a really good look uh, just before the goal even happened. The puck goes back down the ice. And as we mentioned earlier, Hellebuck kind of breaks up that, uh, that icing and then it comes back the other way and the Jets get another great chance. And it's not too often they're going to miss twice. So I'll keep an eye, we'll keep an eye as the season goes on to see if uh, you know there's more overtime situations and more opportunities to play three forwards. But man, like the Jets have barely put in a minute and a half of overtime work <laughs> with this three forward uh, look over the past couple of games. Uh, Jamie, you know Paul has talked about just the maturity of this group, and you sort of touched on it earlier in your earlier answer. But he he had a good uh, quote in his, I think it was his pregame press conference ahead of Saturday's game, you know, just saying he, he can yell some expletives on the bench and nobody's crumpling within themselves. They're, they're just taken in stride and he's hearing the right things on and off the ice so that, you know, he doesn't even have to open his mouth. He just knows that things are right. Just why do you think the Jets are in that position now? I mean, obviously you have players like Nikolai Ehlers, Adam Lowry, Andrew Kopp. You could, the list could go on. These guys aren't young players anymore. They're in the prime of their NHL careers. So just how has that helped the Jets this season? It's just working off one another. And it's been years of watching Blake Wheeler do everything that you need to do uh, on the practice ice. And I think Paul said yesterday to us that this is the most focused he's seen this group of players. And maybe the pandemic plays a big role in this too, guys. There's nothing else to do. So it's those guys are really focused on their craft right now and they are doing the extra work. And one thing, you know, Andrew Klopp went 10 games at a point, and then you see him on the ice working his backhand passes with Jansen Harkins. Uh, yesterday, before morning skate, Josh Morrissey comes out 15 minutes before the skate starts and is taking shots. So you just see that over and over again. And Paul's mentioned numerous times how Paul Stastny will talk with player anybody after practice about certain things. So the conversation and the work that needs to be done is being done by this hockey team. And that all is part of having a veteran group, a veteran leadership group that is showing anybody that comes in, this is how it's done. Not that this is a young team, but anybody that comes like Logan Stanley comes in. They've been watching this guys. These guys do this all training camp and through practice. Uh, Sammy Nuke has been around the team for a little bit, but he comes in and, and he fits right in. So I just think it's just been years and years of the same guys, the same message, and it's working. And there's they're having success because of it. Well, 
moving on to our guest this week. It's uh, Derek Forbert. And uh, I think anybody who's watched some of his uh, media availabilities are probably going, well, this interview must be about five minutes because he's definitely not the most quotable of guys. But not when you sit down with ground control. Uh, Derek talked for a good 15 minutes. Uh, we covered a bunch of different topics, uh, chatted about his uh, dear dog, Darla. She's 10 years old. She's a basset hound. She, uh, she seems like a great little pup. Uh, Derek used to be an umpire. And uh, we talk about winning the Calder Cup championship with the Manchester Monarchs and much more as well. So enjoy this interview. Hi, this is Neil Pionk, and you're listening to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Derek, I had Trevor Lewis on the podcast a few episodes ago, and he said that the car with the California plates in the parking lot is actually yours and that you were having some trouble getting it started in the morning. How happy are you that it's starting to warm up here in Winnipeg? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's been it's been good. I mean, I grew up in pretty a pretty cold climate, so yeah. um, I don't know. I think, uh, I think, yeah, it just took a little bit for my car to adjust, but we're getting there. No block heater in it, I would imagine. That's, yeah, that's what they were saying. I was like, no, I don't think I got one of those when I bought it in L.A. <laughs> Do you have a car back in Minnesota that you could have brought up instead? Uh, no, I mean it's I mean it's a Tahoe, so it does good in the it yeah. does good in the snow and in the cold weather. But it was just kind of a one time thing, and one of the one of the rink guys came and picked me up, so gave <laughs> nice. him gave him a nice little tip. And there you go, perfect. You have a dog, right? Yeah, uh, Darla's that her name? Yeah. Uh, she's she's got some gray around the eyes. How old is she? She's she's an old gal. Um, She's ten years old. Okay, uh, I've had a doctor about a year and a half ago. Um, oh wow! Yeah, I was last year. I was, I was on the IR, and um, you know the boys were on the road a lot, and I was bored, and I was just like, screw this, and I went and got adopted a dog, and um, it's been great. Yeah, what like what's that experience been like? You know, adopting a, a puppy is one thing, but then adopting a dog that's sort of in the back nine of it, of her life. Just what's that been like? Uh, it's, it's been good. I mean, that's kind of my thought process was like, well, I don't really have the time or the energy to go through the whole puppy thing. So, um, you know, just, I don't know, maybe essentially running a dog hospice kind of thing, but, (laughs) (laughs) um, no, it's been good. Like she's a basset hound. She's so old. So, um, just like kind of smaller walks and she doesn't really need a ton of exercise and, you know, she's just kind of looking for a a comfortable place and that's kind of what I try to give her. Now that you're back playing full time, what are you doing with her while you're on the road? I know, I I think Nate Thompson posted a a photo of her on his Instagram. Yeah. Uh, so Nate has like a, like a family friend who lives in Winnipeg and they watch the dogs while we're on the road. So it works out really well. Um, and, uh, Nate's dog and, uh, Darla are really good friends, Darla and Eddie. So they get along great. And, um, you know, Eddie still tries to hump Darla every once in a while, but <laughs> I feel like she, that could be it, yeah, it keeps her young. So that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. So just small walks. How's she enjoying the cold? Oh, she hates it. I um, say. yeah, I bought, I bought a jacket and some booties for her. So we, we throw those on and, uh, we make do, but I mean, she, she's fine unless it's like kind of like below zero. Um, and like American zero Fahrenheit. Yeah. So, but she like when it's snowing out and there's like a lot of like fluffy snow, she loves it. She's just kind of, yeah, she's great. Cool. Uh, obviously with COVID-19, the NHL season looks a whole lot different, especially on the road. What are you doing to keep busy? I mean, obviously you're not going out for dinner with the guys, but just what are you watching on Netflix? Are you a gamer? Do you read? Uh, I don't, I don't game. I've never, I've never been into video games. Um, good for you. On the, I mean, we've got like some designated hangout spots in the hotel, yep. so we, uh, you know, we throw throw a couple of bets down on some ping pong matches and uh, just kind of hang out with the fellows and play some cards and you know watch some TV. So it's uh, it, it sucks, but um, you know we're making the best of it. How's your ping pong game? It's 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 first time I played in about four or five years. So growing up, we had one in the garage, so I was pretty good as a kid. And then uh, it, it's it's not like riding a bike; you lose it pretty quick. You know, is are there some things about the way the NHL season is working this year that, you know, you will be sad to see go away when things get back to normal? Or is it just, you know, let's get rid of this and let's get back to where we were? Uh, definitely back to where we were. I mean, I guess, like, spending, like, a couple of days in a city is kind of cool. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, as far as, like, not being able to go to restaurants or, you know, kind of go out and see the city and what it has to offer, that part, just being cooped up in the hotel, is, yeah. it's, uh, it's not very fun. You know, you come here to Winnipeg, but a lot of familiar faces. Just what's that been like playing with, you know, Trevor Lewis, Nate Thompson, Dave Lowry, guys that you would have crossed paths with back in Los Angeles? Uh, I mean, it's been great. Um, You know, I got to do my quarantine with Nate Thompson. So, um, I mean, 
doing that by yourself would have sucked. So to have, you know, be able to do that with him and work out and stay in shape together was, uh, it was great. And then, uh, you know, me and Louie have been good buddies for a while now. A lot of volleyball, a lot of golf in LA in the summer. So um, it's been good having them there, for them here. Uh, what do you like about the group so far this year? You guys are 12, six and one as we're recording this podcast. It's a, a great record, really solid win percentage. Just what do you like about your group? Uh, it's, it's just a, it's a great group of guys. I mean, you know, we come to the rink and we have fun together and, uh, and just like the leadership group here, you can tell that they really want to win and, you know, they put in the work to win and, um, you know, everyone just kind of follows their lead and, you know, we've been fortunate to, you know, have some success to this far, but, um, you know, it's, it's just going to get harder and harder as we get going here. So we really got to stay on it. I know you're obviously focused on your own game, especially in the, the play in round last year when you were with Calgary, but what differences in Winnipeg do you see now that you're on the team versus what you would have saw last year in the bubble between the two teams? Just how has this team changed here in Winnipeg? Uh, you mean just like, a, like an overall? Kind yeah, of like, like, you know, did you see something where you're like, oh, like Winnipeg's not strong here, but, you know, or you're um, seeing like, you know, this they're better now. I mean, it, it was kind of hard to tell. I mean, Shife went down game one, I think, and uh, was it, I think it was game one. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, like, I mean, that – you take him out of the lineup and it just kind of, I don't know, it just throws a wrench in their, I'm sure their entire plans right. last year. So it was hard to tell. Um, I feel like, I feel like, you know, we got, they got a little deeper and, uh, you know, we got a deep team here now. We got, yeah. obviously, I think Pat Line got hurt last year too. So he wasn't available. And then, you know, we've, now we've got PL and bringing a guy like Staz and Louie and Tomer. And those are like, some, you know, those are some older, you know, veteran kind of real men guys. So uh, that's probably the biggest thing. You're a guy that obviously has just sort of written the, the heart of his NHL career. How valuable is it to have those veteran guys in the room? Oh, I think it's huge, you know. Um, just like just guys that kind of stay even keel. Like they know there's going to be ups and, ups and downs throughout the season, but, um, you know, just kind of just the consistency that, you know, those veterans bring has been, uh, it's been huge for this team for sure. You've developed a really good chemistry with Neil Pionk on the back end. How much of that do you attribute to the, the work you guys did in the summer and fall? I mean, I, I know I was kind of joking about that with the media, when yeah. I, but, uh, I mean, it's hard to tell. Um, I don't know. It's like, cause it's not like we were really doing like right. partner D drills in the summer. Like we had like seven guys, like trying to like put a skate together, like yeah. a bunch of idiots. Like yeah. it wasn't like <laughs> we were like doing like <laughs> partner D drills, but, um, I don't know. I think our games just kind of fit really well together. Like, I mean, when I was in LA, I got to play with Drew Doughty most of the time, and you know Neil reminds me of him, like just the yeah. the way he's able to contribute offensively and at the same time like not give it inch defensively, and just how hard he competes. And there's just a lot of similarities between those two, and you know my game kind of fits with that kind of player. How good does it feel to sort of be that constant D pairing on the team this year, and just you know when Paul needs a reliable shift, he goes to you guys. Just what's that like? Yeah, I mean it's it's uh it's been good. You know, anytime uh, you know, you're getting thrown out there in big situations and, um, you know, you want to do your best. And, um, yeah, I mean, playing with Neil, I think we've, you know, we've done a pretty good job with that to this point. And, you know, we just got to stay with it and not try and do too much, just play our game. I wanted to ask you about that Niels Hoglander situation in Vancouver. And, and obviously it's in the past, it's done with. But he takes a shot at you. You take a couple shots back. There's a melee and and then it's over. But it's really not. Like, how... Like, should it have been over at that point, or did did you have to answer the bell the next day? Like, what is the code? Like, how do you balance that, I guess? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't think I really had to answer the bell, but, yeah. you know, it's just kind of something. I just kind of wanted to bury the hatchet and, yeah. uh, you know, move on. Um, you know, that Hoglander kid competes hard, and, um, I mean, yeah, I just got a little ticked off and, you know, kind of went after him at the end, and, I you know it was basically just like a football fumble dog pile like it wasn't yeah. really like and then uh you know the media makes a big deal out of it and then it just kind of snowballs from there so I don't know if you looked at your Instagram like the comments on there were just border, where they were disgusting I, some guy said he was gonna skin Darla I was like Jesus man <laughs> <laughs> wow okay we'll get off that topic now back when you signed with the team you mentioned you're an umpire and you umpired Neil I guess maybe once or twice uh what age did you start umpiring um, I think I was like 13, 14, like 15 in that age range. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why like, 
I never really, I tried, I tried my best not to really, you know, give it to the refs or the linemen just cause I'm like, I know how hard it is. Like it's, you're making a lot of judgment calls and you're yep. doing your best. And, uh, it's, I mean, it's a terrible job cause every, every call you make one side pissed off and, um, yeah, I definitely have an understanding for the difficulties of that job. That's interesting that you say that. That was kind of my next question. Like just what do you think you learned from umpiring that you sort of carry with you today? Like I refereed for fifteen years and I what you just said. Yeah, it's the worst job ever. Yeah. Like this sucks. Like yeah. I mean you, especially in baseball, like you're, you're you're making a judgment call every fifteen seconds right. and the other team's pissed off. Like it's like <laughs> who can you don't make anyone happy doing yeah. it. So Do you have any good stories of coaches, players or parents just absolutely losing their mind on you? I can't really remember anything. Of course there was just like I mean the, just the one story I have is I remember just absolutely king up Neil and he was pissed off about it and um <laughs> so he was I think his parents were giving me a lot of shit too so we gotta We'll, we'll bury the hatchet when I see them, but um, it was right down the middle. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be swinging with two strikes now. Yeah, exactly. Um, did you ever referee hockey, or was it just um, uh, umpiring just, baseball? Just baseball. Just baseball. Yeah. Do you still play in the summer at all? I don't. Um, just uh, just play a lot of volleyball in the summer now, um, and then you know golf here and there. But no, no more. My brothers are back home playing like a softball league, and I'd love to play in that, but just. It just doesn't work out. Yeah. Um, you know, you won the Calder Cup with Manchester in 1415. How valuable was that experience for your development? Oh, it was great. Um, you know, we had such a – it was such a fun team. We had, uh, like, Paul Bessonette, yep. like Brian O'Neill. Like, I saw Biz had my back on spin chicklets the other day, too. Oh, so did he? I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it was great. I mean, Mike Stuthers was our coach, and he's he's such a good coach, and – everyone just loved playing for him and you know for everyone to like come together and uh go on a run like that and it was especially when it's not you like you don't really have there's not as much like glamour as like going on like a Stanley Cup run yeah it's like you just got to do it because you want to do it like you're not really so it was it was awesome you know obviously those were the you know you came into LA right after they went on their two Stanley Cup run yeah and then you're on the American League team that that wins just having that culture of winning do you think it bled over to that year for you guys and then when you went to the National Hockey League as a full-timer did that help in terms of just knowing how to win yeah I mean obviously it didn't like snowball the way we wanted it to yeah. but um yeah like definitely when I got like once I got to LA like there was such a culture of winning and expecting to win that um you know it made those those years we didn't make the playoffs that much harder so Speaking of a culture of winning, uh, one of the best schools down south, UND, you attended there. You played on the hockey team there. But you're a guy from Minnesota, so when it, what went into the decision to go to UND? Um, I don't know. I, so I, I went on my visit there. Uh, like, growing up, I always kind of thought I was either going to go to UMD or the University of Minnesota. And uh, and then I just kind of I went on my visit to North Dakota, and I just kind of fell in love with the rink and um, just the coaching staff there. And just kind of what that program was about and just kind of how serious it was and how serious they were about developing, you know, NHL players. So um, I don't really know what it was, but it just kind of felt right. Uh, Mark Pullman, I believe is his name. It's Tucker's dad, yeah. the strength guy there. Did you ever run into Tucker at all? He was, he was like, uh, they have like a thing there called like the Hockey Academy, which is like kind of younger kids like that would work out like kind of after us and stuff. So I think I saw him kind of buzzing around and, I mean, Pooley's dad is just an absolute animal. He's still the yeah. best, best athlete I've ever seen. So <laughs> he, was, uh, he was a great strength coach for us. Last question for you. What was your favorite thing to do in Grand Forks off campus? I don't know if you've heard of the Red Pepper, but it's like this like late night restaurant. And I, would, yep. I bet I had about 80% of my meals at the Red Pepper. So it was, <laughs> uh, it, it, when I, the first time I talked to Chipman, though, the first thing we talked about was Red Pepper. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. Appreciate the time, buddy. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Shop where the players shop. Jets Gear and TrueNorthShop.com are your authentic team stores. Make sure to stock up on all your favorite Winnipeg Jets and Manitoba Moose merchandise today. Visit one of the five Jets Gear locations or shop online at TrueNorthShop.com. Uh, Mitchell, uh, the week ahead, Monday and Tuesday, the Winnipeg Jets host the Vancouver Canucks. Obviously, the Canucks aren't happy with where their game's at right now. They'll be coming in hungry. And then later in the week, the Jets head to Montreal for the first time this season for a two-game set. Uh, just kind of preview the week for the for the listeners. Well, those are the two teams that the Jets have beat to go on this four-game win streak. So you want to talk about motivated opponents, you're going to have them in the Montreal Canadiens and Vancouver Canucks. Vancouver's going to have 
three days, well, off from game action, but but three days of practice uh, kind of coming into the first game against Winnipeg. They're winless in four. Uh, so obviously they'll be a motivated group. And, you know, I think the last loss uh, to the Jets where they had the, the two nothing lead and saw that go away. You know, I think that's one of the ones where, you know, the Canucks look back on it and wonder if maybe they didn't deserve a different result. Obviously they didn't get it. Um, the Jets getting one of their six come from behind wins this year after trailing through 20 minutes. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of see that matchup, especially over the course of back-to-back nights on Monday and Tuesday. And then the Jets go to Montreal to start a five game road trip. They play twice in Montreal and, um, kind of the same storyline, to be honest, where the Canadians maybe felt that they played a better game. The Jets after the game saying that, listen, like we weren't very good. Montreal was the better team, but Connor Hellebach won us this game. Um, it'll be interesting to kind of see how the Canadians respond the next time that they see the Winnipeg Jets. So yeah, like there's going to be, uh, you know, a couple of teams that the, the Jets have kind of taken some points off of that want to try to make up ground, especially, I mean, we talked earlier about the Canadians who are, uh, at this point still in a playoff spot and they're looking up and they see the Winnipeg Jets and they know the games played are relatively even. They know they got to make up some ground. And the best way to do that is to take points away from the, the very team that you're chasing. So uh, going to be an interesting week for the Jets. And then it'll be interesting also to see if they're able to keep this season long win streak of four games rolling. Jamie Nikolai Ehlers, he is continuing his production. He obviously assists on the OT winner. He's got 11 goals on the year. Um, obviously not in first because Austin Matthews just seems to be on another level right now, but he's right near the, the league leaders uh, when you look at the standings. Just what's working for him this year? Well, Paul, Paul Maurice has touched on it often is that shooter's mentality and Ehlers isn't looking to pass off the puck anymore. He's looking to shoot it. And a, a great example is the, the game in regulation where Andrew Kopp wins the face off cleanly to him, does not hesitate, steps up and rips a wrist shot off the inside of the post and in. Uh, he's just been so confident in that aspect. And another part too is that you know, that fighting aspect of Nikolai Ehlers game, um, you know, he takes on Corey Perry, he may as well take on, you know, he's fought Ryan Geslaff, so why not Corey Perry as well? And talking with Paul Maurice about that, I'm like, are, are, are we making too big of a deal in the media about Nikolai Ehlers fighting? He's like, no, you're not making enough of a big deal. And he talked about his first fight in Denver against Tyson Berry, and he said he was yelling from the bench, no. And then the fight against Guest Lab, he says, I was screaming again, no. He so, so now after the fights, he's like, now you look at him, you go, okay, Mr. Ehlers, and walk off. He's got that little bit of swag to him. So the guys in the bench love it. And so I think Nikolai Ehlers is showing all aspects of his game, the fact that he can't be pushed around, um, won't take anything, and is not afraid to shoot the puck now. And he's done a great job. And, man, it's uh, – I think if – I don't want to say it's been a benefit that Patrick Lane has got traded, but I think it's kind of freed up Nikolai Ehlers to become more shooter savvy in some ways. He's not afraid. He's not looking for Patrick Lane in some aspects. He's looking more to shoot the puck, and, it, and it's working. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of things that are working, Connor Hellebuck, we've talked about him at length on this podcast already, but Mitch just, you know, he lets in that softy from Nick Suzuki pretty much at the goal line. That's a goal that obviously he's going to want back, but he comes back and then stones Brendan Gallagher. And I thought that was just such a, a microcosm moment of who Connor Hellebuck is as a goaltender. He might give up that one that he doesn't like, but then the next one it's saved. So just what have you seen from him in that regard? Yeah. It's just that bounce back man mentality that he's had ever since he came into the national hockey league. It's almost like you could guarantee if he has a start, even that he doesn't like, he's going to come back the the next game and it's going to be real tough to beat him. And uh, that's been probably one of his most uh, you know, it's maybe it's not a stat that's kept on say NHL.com, but it's one that I think has been following Connor Hellebuck. It's just the fact that, you know, if the might, the, the small version, like you mentioned, the fact that, you know, if one gets by him that he doesn't like, well, that second one's probably not going to happen. And that's exactly what happened uh, against the Montreal Canadians when he made those 40 saves and, then you take a little bit of a more of a bigger view. And if it's a game that he doesn't like, then the bounce back is going to be there the next start. And, you know, he's tied for third in the national hockey league and, and wins with 10 now um, as we record this and then tied for 10th and, and save percentage as well. You know, he's just slowly kind of just making his way back up to the top of those uh, and into the, among the league leaders of, of those stats that he always seems to be in and around you know how badly he wants to get on the, on the board with, with shutouts because 
I, I found it uh, interesting in his post game uh, after the overtime went over the Canadians that he said, you know, 99 times out of a hundred that Suzuki shot doesn't go in. Uh, but it did this time. And that seems to be a theme this year. It always seems like there's the one goal that Connor Helbig absolutely hates that beats them, that prevents them from getting that, uh, that shutout. Obviously Lauren Brassois has one. So Connor Hellebuck and will want to get on the board with that as well. So hopefully for him, that comes in the next little bit, but otherwise he's just been spectacular for the Winnipeg Jets this year. I don't know about you guys, but every game I watch now, I keep thinking, is this the day that he gets that, shut out and it just it doesn't seem to happen for him but i'm sure it will at some point anyway gentlemen thank you so much for taking the time here on a sunday afternoon uh if you need to go to bed early tonight because the 9 p.m starts uh please do so we have games monday and tuesday thanks so much for listening to ground control this is big ground control the official podcast of the winnipeg jets hosted by jets tv for jets news videos and more head to winnipegjets.com 